Well, good morning, church, and Happy New Year. We are now officially 2019. <laughs> For some of you, that's a good thing. Get 2018 put away. We have much opportunity in 2019, and it's exciting to see what God is going to do here at Aldersgate. I asked God uh, many weeks ago, as I was planning out the sermon series, and I said, Lord, it's January, and so the office is going to be pretty busy. We're doing some changes, and, and we're just kind of moving into this vision and understanding what discipleship means, and, and we have new people on board to help us to see the vision that God has for us. And so I'm like, so God, what is it that you want me to preach? It's going to be busy, so how about Acts? Because I like Acts, and that's pretty easy to preach. And I didn't get an A-OK -okay on Acts. Well, what about Romans? Because I studied Romans in, in seminary, and so I understand that theology. No, I didn't get an A-OK -okay in Romans either. I love the Hebrew Bible. And so I turned to the Hebrew Bible, and I said, Lord, what about the Old Testament? Is there something, is there a word that you want to give the good people at Aldersgate? And I sat in prayer day after day, and Nehemiah came to mind. And I said, Nehemiah? I'm not sure I've ever read, read Nehemiah from book from 1 to 14, and I certainly have never preached Nehemiah. Really? Are you sure, Nehemiah? Well, friends, I began to read Nehemiah. It began to open up my heart in the context of where we are as a culture, as a world, and then more importantly, as a church and a United Methodist Church. Wow, does Nehemiah speak. Speaks right into our individual hearts, right into this church, right into our United Methodist Church, and right into the world in which we live. So I can tell you that I am excited to bring Nehemiah to you. But I will warn you first, we are going to go deep. And this first sermon, we are going to go pretty deep, and it might seem like it is somber. Not all of Nehemiah is somber. But today, there is a hard word. So you're forewarned, okay? Now in this sermon, I've given you some questions to take home with you in the life notes. I could not have packed it with everything that I need to be able to tell you as we work through this first chapter of Nehemiah. So if you're going to be here every week, and I just hope you are, if you miss one of the weeks, you're just going to miss it. You can go out on, on YouTube and you can hear the sermon, but please try the very best that you can to be here so that we can share this word from God together. And so you might want to bring your Bibles if you are someone who likes to underline or write notes in your Bible. This will be the sermon series. You'll want to do that. Bring a piece of paper because I can't chalk it full in the worship folder. Bring your heart. Because God has something for us. Can you turn to someone and say, God has something for us? Just tell someone, God has something for us. So here we go. Do you know that you are a person of influence? Do you know that? You are. You might prefer introversion, but you are a person of influence. You might prefer extroversion, but you are a person of influence. Do you know that in 1645, one person had influence. One person, one vote that gave Oliver Cromwell control of England. 1649, one vote, one person caused Charles I of England to be executed. In 1845, one vote brought Texas into the Union. One vote, one person. In 1868, one vote saved President Andrew Jack Johnson from impeachment. 1875, one vote saved France from a monarchy to a republic. In 1876, one vote gave Rutherford B. Hayes the U.S. presidency. And probably most convicting to me, 
is in 1923. One vote, one person of influence gave Adolf Hitler control of the Nazi party. Church, each one of you is a person of influence. The question is, what influence would you like to have on another person's life, on this community, and on our world? And so if you have your Bibles with you, or if you want to pull them out of the pew Bibles, you're going to want to just read along here. We're in Nehemiah 1. Next week will be Nehemiah 2, so you can prepare this week. I would ask that you would read the chapter more than once during the week, that you would just familiarize so that the Word of God can speak into your heart. Let me give you some background. As Nehemiah opens, it says Nehemiah prays for his people. Well, not exactly, not just yet. What Nehemiah does is that he inquires about how the people who lived in Jerusalem were faring. And Nehemiah has a response to inquiring. He listens, and then he responds this way, starting at verse 5 in Nehemiah 1. He says, I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear, O God, be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I'm confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both I and my family have sinned. And then he continues, we have offended you deeply, O God, failing to keep the commandments, the statutes, and the ordinances that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and you keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are under the farthest skies, I will gather them. I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen to establish my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. So, O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. At the time... Nehemiah was a cupbearer, a person of influence, the word of God for the people of God. So let me give you the back story of Nehemiah so you can appreciate this man of influence and you can appreciate how your life can be affected and transformed the screen that will show up before you kind of gives us a timeline of where Nehemiah is in the whole history of Israel. For you see, Assyria conquered the northern kingdom, which was Israel. The northern kingdom and the southern king kingdom had split. In 606 BC, Babylon carried off the first captives from the southern kingdom. And when Babylon carried off the captors, they scattered them. They didn't want them to be a threat to their empire. And so everyone was just taken and, and taken into the, to the new land or, or scattered so that influence was not felt. Now in 598 BC, Daniel and his companions were carried off to Babylon. And then we find that Jerusalem falls and the temple is absolutely plundered. But Persia comes into power. And under Cyrus, conquers Babylon. The first Jews returned to Jerusalem by, from Babylon because what Persia decided is that if they kept the captives in their homeland, if they let them return, then they were more favorable to the new government. And so they were using a psychology to say, well, let them gather together. 
because they won't revolt against us if they do so. And so in 516, the temple is restored, and then Esther becomes queen of Persia, and then Ezra, the priest in that time period, leads a second expedition to Jerusalem from Babylon. So Ezra takes more people back to Jerusalem. So now Jerusalem is gaining some momentum as far as being Jerusalem again. But there's problems. And then we find that in 445, this is where Nehemiah sat. Nehemiah and Ezra are really contemporaries. And Nehemiah then is called to go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so we have this setting. Now you have to understand that Nehemiah was born in Persia. He was born in, in a captive land. And so Nehemiah has no understanding, so to speak, of Jerusalem. He's never lived there. They're not his people, although he's Jewish. He has only known Persia. And remember, the last of our reading says Nehemiah is a cupbearer. So he has a place of authority in the palace. The cupbearer was the one who would present the, the king with food and with drink. And the cupbearer would taste it first and make sure that no one was trying to kill the king. And then he would give the food to the king, a very important job. The cupbearer also was a companion to the king and sometimes had the ear of the king. The king would talk to the cupbearer. And so Nehemiah understood that he was a person of influence, no matter how small, he had influence. But God had been preparing this man's heart long before the very first verse of this chapter ensues. God had been preparing Nehemiah to start to listen, for his heart to be open for the things that break the heart of God. Do you know it's a prerequisite for us as people of prayer? That we have to first allow our hearts to be open to say, God, what is it you want to say to me? What is it you want to bring me? What things do you want to bring in my heart that are going to break my heart that break yours? It's an interesting prayer for 2019 is to get up every morning and to pray this unlikely prayer that the church is not used to praying. And then that prayer is to be able to say, God, today, would you break my heart for what breaks yours? Can you imagine the difference? Instead of getting up and saying, well, Lord, this is the day before me and these are the things that I need. No, God, would you break my heart for the things that break your heart? And then we would listen. Because the very first thing that Nehemiah does is he has a heart to listen. He has a heart to be able to, as Hananiah comes back from, from Jerusalem, he's able to say, Hananiah, how is it with you? How is your soul? And how are my people in Jerusalem? How's my homeland? In the culture in which we live in, we can understand that, can't we? We have friends and we have co-workers that have been born in this country, but they still ache for their homeland. They still have an affinity and they have a heart for their homeland. And Nehemiah has this heart. Susa might have been his capital, but Jerusalem was the capital of his heart. Jerusalem was the capital of Nehemiah's heart. And so he asks, when was the last time, friends, that you looked at someone and you said, how are you? I bet most of you, because you're kind, kind people, most of you, when you came into this church this morning, you probably saw someone, right? And you said, hi, how are you? And what did you get in response? Fine, how are you? It's what we do in this culture. But that's not Nehemiah's way, nor is it the way that Christ is calling us. The question that this church, that you and I need to ask, that the church needs to start asking is, how are you? How's your soul? How are you? And then wait long enough for the answer. And when the answer comes and it's not the trite answer, oh, I'm fine, how are you? That you stay still and you listen because Nehemiah stayed still. And he heard, he heard that in, in verse 4, he finds out that the city is in ruins. It's just in ruins. The wall is just broken down. This is, this is a city that's supposed to be the city of God. Can you imagine the neighbors? That they probably looked on to this rubble, to this just rat trap of a mess. I can imagine that the neighbors who are worshiping other gods goes, this is the city of God? This is like what it's supposed to look like? 
if God is so, so great and mighty, then why is this city in ruins? And Nehemiah hears this, and his heart just starts to break. And so in verse 4, if you're following along, verse 4, it says, and, and don't, don't miss this, it says, when I heard these words, I what? I sat down. I sat down. Now, if you are Hebrew in that time period, it means that when you sit down, that means that you are mourning. It means that you are in this kind of attitude and condition of abasement and penitence. You sit down. Because when you pray, if you're a Jewish, a Hebrew person, you stand up. It's how they prayed. But now Nehemiah does something really different, and he just sits down. He sits down. And we continue, and in verse 4 it says, He wept, he fasted, and he prayed. He wept, he fasted, and he prayed. Now, this is where it's going to get hard. Because I believe that this broken down Jerusalem might be an apt metaphor for the church today. Friends, I believe that you and I come into this place that we call holy space, and we make sure our smiles are on our face, don't we? We make sure that when we come in, that we portray within our person and our words that I got this together. Everything's fine. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? And you move on. Because God forbid that we really be the church. God forbid that we recognize that we've got some broken walls, that there's some breaches in the wall. God forbid that we feel defenseless and we tell someone, I'm vulnerable. God forbid that we say, I've fallen victim to some unhealthy habits. God forbid that we say to one another, I have a root of bitterness that's in me, and I can't seem to get over it. And so will you sit with me? Will you weep? Will you fast? And will you pray over me? Because I want to be well. God forbid that there's a feeling of betrayal in us, and it remains in a secret place in our heart. Maybe nobody else is aware of the ruin and the brokenness, but you know what? Jesus loves you so much with a reckless love that there's no mountain he won't climb. There's no wall he won't break down to get to your heart. He wants us to be church, and that means we have to sit down in seasons of our life, in seasons of our church. Maybe at the start of a brand new year, we need to sit down And we need to weep over the things that God is weeping over. We need to fast. That's a word you don't hear too often, do you? We don't talk about fasting, and yet the Word of God is just full of examples and times in which God's people fasted because they yearned to hear from God. They yearned to receive direction and discernment. And so Jesus said, fast. Fast. Jesus himself fasted. So what's fasting? Let me say a few words about fasting. Fasting is when you intentionally uh, give up something that's a regular routine or a habit in your life for a season so that you can center and focus your mind and your heart on the things of God. And so most of the time we think about fasting being we're going to give up food. And that's certainly, that's certainly an appropriate way to fast. But there's many other ways to fast. You can give up a whole lot, but you're denying yourself because you want to redirect your energy, your time, and your attention to say, God, there's something that's breaking my heart that I know is breaking your heart. And I want to give my attention solely to you during this time period. And so I'm not going to be distracted by food or or by something else. I'm, I'm giving that up, Lord, because I'm just going to sit down And I'm going to give you my attention until this passes, until this is resolved. And so Nehemiah does that for an extended period of time. Now we enter the story, and we enter the story, and we look at verse 4, and it seems like that's when Nehemiah started to pray. But no. In verse 1, we find out Nehemiah has been praying. He's a praying man. But in verse 4, he says, Then I got busy. Have you been there? Have you said, sure, I pray. 
but it's kind of like microwave praying. You know what microwave praying is, right? You put it in, you say, God, I'm, I'm in need of something, and so, you know, you, you put the prayer request in, and if you don't hear from God right away, what do you say? Well, that didn't work. Well, maybe I'll pray for a week, but if that doesn't work, then, then maybe something's wrong with me, maybe something's wrong with God, or maybe this prayer thing doesn't work, and maybe I'll just quit. Can I tell you and my heart the hard word that we're more accustomed to microwave praying in the culture that we live in? We haven't even scratched the surface of what God intends for us in being people of prayer. When was the last time that you cried? You cried over someone's life, their condition, their soul, their pain, their agony. When was the last time you cried over them? Sure, we're good about crying over ourselves. We bring God all that hurts. I trust we do that, and Jesus wants us to do it. But Jesus also wants us to have our hearts broken over someone else. Jesus wants us to reach outside of ourselves, outside of this church, and to say, God, as I walk the neighborhood, as I go to work, what is it, God, that's breaking your heart? Because I'm, my heart's open to have that to break my heart as well. And so Nehemiah, on verse 4, he gets down to it. And he really begins to pray, weeping, fasting, praying, focused effort. And he does that for 52 days. That is not microwave praying, is it? I don't know when the last time I spent 52 days solely focused on something, something that I knew God was calling me to the heart of prayer with. Gosh, have we changed from people of the word. Shameful. And God says, if you return to me, I'll open up the floodgates. And I'll give you what you request. Nehemiah remembers the promises. He just confesses it. He says, God, you know what? We've sinned. Now I want to say, Nehemiah, you weren't born. You were in Persia. This isn't your sin, Nehemiah. This was past generations. But Nehemiah doesn't say that. He says, God, we have sinned. I have sinned against you. My people have sinned against you. And I'm going to lump it all together and say we have sinned. Can I, I, can I just possibly open up the door to your thinking that what if we, as Aldersgate Church, started that our motto was that we are a church that has sinned? What if we went out and we told people, hey, come to Aldersgate because we're broken? I mean, I go around and I tell people since I've been here, come to Aldersgate because it's awesome. These people are like no other. You need to come and you need to mix with, that, with these people. And that is wonderful to say. But you know what it says sometimes to people? Oh, you have it together. And I'm probably not welcomed. Probably your theology won't match my theology. Your opinions won't match my opinions. And so I better just stay away. But what if instead we said to our community, come to Aldersgate because we're broken. Because our walls are broken. We got some stuff. We've got some issues. We've got some addictions. And we would just love to welcome you into our mess because God is the redeemer of our mess. Amen? God is the reason that you're here and I'm here. It's not because we have pretty smiles. It's not because we dress well and we look like we have it all together. No, actually, it's because we know that God is the redeemer of our brokenness. And we know that at some time in our life, we're going to deal with some kind of brokenness. Nobody gets away in life without having a season of brokenness, at least one. And for some of us, every year... Every year we can say, yep, there was a season of brokenness. And I just pray you can say, and God redeemed my brokenness. God redeemed it. So can I tell you, church, that we need to get outside of ourselves and we need to begin to feel people's pain in our heart. 
We need to feel people's pain in our heart before we could ever call ourselves church. And so Nehemiah in verse 6, he confesses the wrongdoing, individual and corporate. And then when you go to verse 8, he remembers God's promises. He says, God, I know who you are. Look at this. Nehemiah knew. He was a man of responsibility that knew the heart of God. He was a man of vision, but he knew God was his ultimate vision. He was a man of prayer, but he knew that God was the one to transform. He wasn't. He was a man of action and cooperation, but first he sat down because he said, I can do nothing until I kneel before God and get marching orders. He was a man of compassion, but he knew that his God was most compassionate of all. He was a man who triumphed over opposition, but first he brought his own opposition to the throne of grace. And he was a man with the right motivation, and he was ready for God to use him. You know, there were two Irishmen who unfortunately depict the kind of prayers that we offer. Mike and Pat were narrowly escaped death on a sinking ship. They were floundering around in the icy ocean waters on a couple of planks. Now, Pat was addicted to some foul behavior. He had a bad mouth, and he decided that maybe he ought to repent. If he was going to die, maybe he ought to repent, and maybe God would save him. And so his buddy thought that that theology was pretty sound. And so Pat began to pray. But just before arriving of that complete dump, you know what I'm talking about, like, okay, God, here it is, honest and all, here it is, this is who I am, and I'm just bringing it to you. Mike spotted a ship. And as delighted as Columbus was when he first spotted the North American shore, Mike hollered, hold it, Pat, don't commit yourself. There's a ship. And Pat immediately stopped praying. Isn't that the way with many of us? I mean, when you and I are in a jam, we know where to go, right? Oh, we're flat on our knees and we're praying. And as soon as it's resolved, we stand back up and we forget. We forget that our knees is a permanent position. We forget all about God. So, church, I have to ask you, do you believe you're a person of influence? And do you believe that God is aching, aching to break your heart with what breaks his heart so he can use you as a person of influence? Or are you content, and am I content, just to be, you know, just praying, God, this is what I want, this is what I need, and so you're kind of my vending machine, God. And once I get what I want, then I'm on my happy little way. Are we willing to spend the time that it takes to listen to someone else outside of ourselves? To care for someone else's brokenness and the trouble that they're going through and sit in the mess of that and to say, God has asked me to be a person of influence to make a difference for you. Nehemiah, in verse 11, he asks God, for marching orders. He says, God, remember me because I'm a cupbearer. In whatever way, Lord, my small role in this world, in your people, whatever way I can be a person of influence, I'm willing to do so. And Nehemiah, like Esther, as you'll find out in the next coming weeks, takes a risk with his very life and he finds out God is a faithful God. This is a win-win situation. When we open up our hearts and we say to God, I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to start feeling the burden of someone else's pain in my heart. You know, that's empathy. That's what it means. I feel your pain in my heart. Sympathy is just, yep, I know your pain. We're very sympathetic. But empathy is that time it takes to get to know what someone's going through, to understand and to give respect to it, not to judge it, to say we may not agree, but you're my brother, you're my sister. Empathy is saying we're the body of Christ. Do you know what that means? That means if we're the body of Christ, when the arm is hurting, the whole body hurts. When you have a headache, do you function well? 
Do you? No. When your back hurts, do you function well? No. When there's someone in the body who is broken, do you understand the whole body experiences that brokenness? Or at least we should if we're truly the body of Christ? So how are we doing? How are we doing? Because Jesus says, if you return to me and obey my commands, I'll heal your land. Confession is not beating or tearing oneself up over what's done in the past. Confession is reminding oneself what can be done in the present. It's coming to Jesus and saying, oh God, I have sinned and I know your promises and I know your forgiveness is for me and with me. So prayer for Nehemiah was not what we have made it. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's also not an emotional outpouring It's a practical workout. In 2019, church, can I challenge you? Are you willing to use prayer as a practical workout? To do it without ceasing. To go deep in the well of prayer. And then to wait. And to ask for marching orders. And to be willing to see this incredible gift of prayer of what God intended it to be. Because you are a person of influence. How will you use your influence? Nehemiah is a book about building a work for God. But you know what? As I think about the good work that we can do for God in 2019, it doesn't start without someone going to their knees. Every good work of God starts with people who are willing to go to their knees and stay on their knees until marching orders are received. And then to take those marching orders and to stay in an attitude of prayer, 52 days, Nehemiah was singly focused, but it was 12 years that he lived out this prayer. 12 years from chapter 1 until chapter 14 in Nehemiah. 12 years of prayer for this person of influence. And he changed the course of the nation of Israel. So, here's my hard words. I love you. But here's my hard words to me and to you. I believe right now, in this day and age, we're a church without crying. We give without sacrificing. We live without fasting. Is it any wonder that we sow without reaping? We're a dry-eyed church in a hell-bent world. We're dry-eyed. We don't want our hearts to break. They're broken enough. We certainly don't want our hearts to break over someone else. Our eyes are dry. Our faith is old. It's stale. It's complacent. You hear the story of Jesus dying for you every day. What's the big deal? It's not new. It's not fresh. Our hearts are hard. And friends, I believe our prayers are cold. But the good news is they don't have to stay that way. We are invited into a new day. New are your mercies every morning. We are invited to a new time and a new place. God knows our world needs it. God knows this church needs it. There are broken people in six months that I have sat with and it breaks my heart that they're struggling. But they need the freedom and the welcome to come and to say to you, I'm broken. And that you're able to say, I'm so glad you're here because I'm broken too. And that's what defines us as church as we have a Savior that heals our brokenness. You know, tears are a language that God understands. God is moved by tears. I'm not talking about the crocodile tears. I'm not talking about the tears that that are obligatory. I'm talking about the heartfelt passion to say, God, I'm going to open up my heart and I'm going to start to listen. And I'm going to listen when I'm at work and when I'm at home. And even when I'm at church, I'm going to listen 
so that someone, when I say, how are you, how is it with your soul, that they have permission, they have trust, that they can say, not so good, not so good. And that we can be a church that responds, I understand. Can I walk with you, not judge you? We don't have to agree. We don't have to agree on any theological issue. We have to agree on love. For that's what our Savior calls us to.